Gronode, it's the central module in the brain of our system. It's the one that controls all the other modules, and at the same time, it's connected to the Internet of Things, so you can have notifications or you can control your grow anywhere, anytime. PowerBot, it's the one that controls the power in your grow. So lights, fans, ventilation, it can control it all. Up to four outputs, it's up to you to choose what you have. Just with the starter kit, it's the basic for any grower. You have the control of your light, control of your irrigation, control of your ventilation, and PowerBot comes with a temperature and humidity probe, so with just this kit, you can control the climate inside your grow. SoilBot is an essential module if you're growing on soil. It has the ability to check for the moisture of four different mediums. This means that you can control the irrigation of four different plants separately and you can give the water that they need just when they need it. At the same time, it has two temperature probes that you can use on soil, air or water. It's up to you to choose what you want to sample. As a security feature, it also comes with a flood detector. This flood detector is really useful in case of leakages. If you have a leak in your grow and water is pouring on the floor, this will trigger the sensor and all of your grow will shut down and send you a warning to tell you that you have a problem and you need to solve it. TankBot is a very versatile module. Not only controls with precision your water tank, it can also provide you some security features. As inputs, it can measure the pH of your water, the temperature and the conductivity. You can also measure the level of your water tank by level switches, in this way you always know when you have or you are lacking water in your grow. At the same time it can control four outputs. These are 12 volts or 24 volts outputs, which is intended to control electrovolves and peristaltic pumps. Electrovolves, so you can control the flow of your irrigation, and peristaltic pumps to make precision control, of, for example for nutrients or pH. As security, these inputs can be used to connect smoke detectors, motion detectors, fire detectors, enhancing the general security of your grow. Okay, hello, my name is João Melo and I'm the founder of OpenGrow. And at OpenGrow, we dedicate ourselves to the creation of automation systems for the urban farmer. So if you're growing any kind of plants at your home, for sure we can help you automate it. Hello, my friend. I love my international friends. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Great. Oh, and good. Is it, are, I'm good. I mean, I mean, I have to say, I cannot complain. I mean, I get to see everyone. Um, I'm, look, the pandemic has been really good because I got to slow down a little bit. So this is yeah, yeah, this is good. Um, all right. So, uh, where where are you? Where are you calling me from today? Okay. I mean, uh, I'm going to be more specific. I mean, Viseu. <laughs> it's the town in Portugal. That's where I am at the moment. All right, so I haven't been there yet. So this is one of the sad moments for me. Like every year, I'm very lucky to be in Portugal and I haven't mm -hmm. been there yet. So from Porto or from like well, from Lisbon, where are we exactly? Okay, so you have Porto on the top, Lisbon on the middle bottom and Viseu yep. is somewhere right here. In the, what, is it, the interior. what is it known for? Oh, good question. What are we known for? Uh, <laughs> I think the biggest hero that we have was some guy that basically fought the Romans with some sticks and rocks. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he made like a siege for, for several years, I believe. And that, that's the biggest story of Viseu, I think. I think that's a good one. I think yeah. I, I think that's a good one. That's a really good one. Yeah, we can do a lot with with the sticks and rocks, you know? <laughs> <laughs> that, that means where you, you're just telling the world that you're innovative. So see? Yeah. Innovative. Innovation started right from where you were from. Yeah. And resilient. Huh? And, and resilient. All right. <laughs> um, I want everyone to understand um, before we talk about your business, mm -hmm. you know who you are. Like, where did you come? Like, where you? Wh what was the upbringing that led you to being an entrepreneur? And what did you do prior to actually starting your business? Okay, so uh, I'm an electronic engineer by by education. Uh, oh, and even before to... be, I want you. I want to know who you are oh. before. Oh, even... that's hard. That's kind of psychological uh, uh, <laughs> consults. Okay, uh, so before I know, I don't know. I was when I was a kid, I was fascinated for for things I don't understand and. I remember being a kid and looking at an electronic board and saying to myself, I'll never understand anything of this. And at some point I started to study it. Uh, I always like space and stuff like that, the cosmos, the biology, how animals work and they gather together in society. So I always was a bit fascinated by the world in, in general. 
uh, and yeah, so I, I went to an engineering education, mostly science. Uh, I still value a lot science nowadays, and it's something that I keep on going on. <laughs> it depends. It, it doesn't matter if it's professional, even on a personal level. I do it a lot. I see a lot of things about physics, uh, nature, you know, you name it. Everything that's related to our world or to our universe in general. And so I studied on a professional degree, like for college. Uh, so I didn't do the normal college. I already had a like a technical uh, uh, vertent on it based on electronics and uh, and after that I went to the university the same on electronics I started to grow a passion for growing plants mostly in dark with lights with all that stuff and as an engineer I look at it and I saw okay there's a lot of stuff I can control here uh, so I started to do my gadgets <laughs> and at some point at the end of the degree I had uh, the chance to do a final project for my car course I had like four or five uh, things that I could do, but none of them really pushed, pulled me. So I, I, I promoted my own project, which was an automation system for an hydroponic uh, culture. Uh, I went along with it, it worked. It was kind of clumsy and big and not knowledgeful. <laughs> uh, and I always kept the thing, okay, I want to build this better. I know that I can make a product out of it. I know that the other products on the market are not doing stuff that I needed to do. Uh, and yeah, when the company started a bit like that, uh, I always wanted, uh, at the beginning, you think that bosses, they have it all, you know, they, they have the money, they have the, the fame, they have it all. But uh, in, when you start a company, you realize, soon you realize that it's not all about that. You have the work, you have the responsibilities, you have the, the hours that you don't still sleep thinking how we're going to pay our employees, stuff like that. And so, but it's a responsibility that I like. Yeah, at some point. It's it's stressful, but it's it, it puts you on the edge, you know, something like that. So I'm curious, is there anyone in your family that's an entrepreneur? Yes, actually, my, my father. Yeah, he worked a lot for, for third parties for several years. And at some point, he decided to open a company with a friend. Uh, and it went great. Uh, and now, actually, he's the main investor here at Open Grow, yeah. So it's, it's so interesting because, um, well, that and also, well, before I, I'm sorry, I, I get so excited about certain questions, but then I'm like, oh, oh. <laughs> go back. When you were younger, did your parents see that interest that you had in you? I mean, did they, did they push you towards being an engineer? Because you were curious. You were curious, and, and most children are curious, but you're mm -hmm. curious about how specific things worked in regards of electronics. So did they actually find ways to get you to go that way or did you discover it yourself? I don't think they pushed me that way. What they did was kind of educate me that way. So science was a thing. I remember my father explaining me like how the time zones work with an orange, you know, telling me like the earth rotates like this and you have every slice, it's one hour, stuff, stuff like that. And I get a lot of lessons like that during lunch and during dinner. Mm -hmm. uh, so science was always a thing like search for it, understand it, study it and you better understand the world but they never pushed me i think that if i was a lawyer they would be okay with it i wouldn't but they would <laughs> and, and did you um i mean you could have worked for any company i mean you're you're clearly smart you could have worked for any company um was it because there was entrepreneurship already in your house and you just saw the way it was or did you realize no no i cannot work for other people it was uh it, it's kind of how can I say it's kind of strange because when I started my let's say first engineering work and I, I, I understood the responsibility of building things and they have to work and you have to give support to them and and it was on a factory so the factory could not stop I was doing like important job mm -hmm. and at some point I thought to myself okay but I, I don't want this responsibility I just want to you know like tighten the same screw every day and don't bother me uh, but what happened is whenever I think like this, it's like I get more responsibilities. <laughs> so I do the opposite. You know, I went around and I thought, OK, these guys are building electronics. They have a, a team of 100 people. Uh, if they can do it with the one product, maybe I can do the same with my product. And that was a, yeah, a big push, seeing a big company doing in electronics and, and, and being successful. I think that was the major push. push yeah. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm connecting the dots here. So mm -hmm. the love of plants. So I attempted, so during the pandemic, um, I attempted to build a, 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 a garden. Um, mm -hmm. I have, a, I have like a, 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 it's called a coppola, which is basically like at the very top of the house, 
where there's this little room. It's okay. Little yeah. Insulated, um, but beautiful. It gets beautiful light. So during the summer, it's super hot. During the winter time, it's super cold. But it's a great spot to like grow an indoor garden. Mm -hmm. So I bought the buckets, the whole entire thing. Um, the first time I did it two years ago, um, I failed. Like nothing grew. Yeah. It was like, horrible. <laughs> The second time I did it, the peppers did good, the 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 basil, the parsley did good, nothing, no tomatoes, no nothing. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh my God, maybe I'm just bad at this. The third time was, which was this year, the cucumbers and I got into an argument every day. The cucumbers <laughs> and I, were, we're fighting every day. She needs water, she doesn't need water. She finally made cucumbers, I was very happy, but she took over everything, she killed the tomato, she strangled the tomato. She okay. I mean, it was ugly, because mm -hmm. she was in charge, but, at least I produced. I was like, yes. Yeah. Something. Something, so something didn't work. Where did you, like, why did you just start doing a garden um, indoors? I mean, what was that purpose of creating? Because, I mean, you could you could be outside. You could just do it anywhere. Why, yeah. why indoors? And was it the gardening, creating food, or was it the lighting, the electricity, the engineering that you enjoyed the most? Actually, yeah, it was a bit of both. Yeah, it was a bit of both. Because as you say, the plants just by themselves without any engineering, they are pure engineers of nature, right? Mm -hmm. So as you said, the cucumbers struggled the, the tomato because they needed the space. Yep. And probably if you go online and if you search, you'll understand that you cannot put cucumber cucumbers next to next to sorry next to tomatoes no so, now i know <laughs> yeah now you know exactly and 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 as you say the first year i saw nothing grew the second year was a bit better you start it, it's a big world with a lot of knowledge whether it is the engineering side that you can control like climate and ventilation and fertilizers whether it is the the plant itself and what it does and different plants have, they have different needs mm -hmm. uh, and once you understand that you also know a bit more so yeah, it was a bit of the, 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 the wow factor of all of that, you know, like it's slow. How can a plant that does not move, does not speak, you know, in, it takes months to grow, but you see it grow, even if it's like on every week, because if you go there every day, you won't notice it. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it was a bit of passion for both. Although, um, although with the cucumber, it was creepy because I would see it on one day and then the next day I'd come back and it would just stretch and grab on things. And I'm like, this is like the weirdest thing I've ever, ever seen in my entire life. It's the creepiest plant. But I was, again, uh, unlike the tomato, the tomato, you don't see it growing. Um, yeah. In a couple days, it's the only, I, I, the viney ones, like anything that's a, a yeah. vine, they have a mind of their own. Probably it may have something to do with the predatory side of the plant. You know, it has to be faster than the others. Oh. Something like that. I'm not talking as a biologist here, eh? just an opinion. <laughs> no, but, but this is like, I mean, this is your, your, your world. So once you started creating, I mean, you, this was on your, was this a passion that you just did because I wanted to do it at home or was it something that was part of a project that you started to grow? Because you talked about that a little bit at the beginning of our conversation, but what was it where, how did, when did it go from a passion just for fun to a, I think I'm going to start a business? Oh, that's an hard one. Uh, it go, how can I say, after the, that final project that I did for the university and I started to work and I worked, I don't know, at least six years after that for other companies, mm -hmm. I was developing my own controllers at home. You know, I was getting what I learned at the job and creating stuff at home. So I would get out of the job and go to work mm -hmm. or something like that. Uh, and yeah, I had a first prototype that I used that was working and doing what I needed. And I think that was the point when I got the first prototype that I said, okay, this kit, because the one from the university couldn't be a product, it was something really rough, really. But the second one was more like I could put it in a box, <laughs> it had some buttons, I could make, make a product out of it. And I think that was the point when I got the technology or when I got it, the knowledge that I need to do the product that I wanted. Yeah. Why is there a need for what you created? Okay. Uh, as you said, plants, they are very different from each other and very competitive uh, and they like the best environment to thrive. Uh, whether it's just the climate around them or even in the soil. They need the right pH, the right uh, amount of nutrients. You cannot pour too much or too less. And, and I believe all of this, even if you control, I believe, I, I know for sure that if you control of all of these aspects, you get a better plant. 
Uh, and that's what our clients are looking for mostly. So there are two things they are looking to get the better plans. So they, they want all the variables under control. Uh, and the second one is they want to ease the job that they have on their grow because uh, for example, in hydroponics, uh, which is the, the, the process of growing plants without soil, or just with water, you need to really control the pH and the nutrients amount on the water. If one of these is not good in one or two days or even hours, you can see the results on your plants because it's quite fast, the, the, the absorption. Um, and so, for example, just controlling the pH, going there every day, measuring the pH, it's not good and dumping some, some acid or some base, just this takes you a few hours a day. And with our system, you can easily turn that switch off and just say, okay, the system does it. The pH is always six, it's good. Uh, and when you start gathering stuff, you start to save a few minutes here, a few hours there, and you save a lot of time during your, your production if you're doing that. The, um, we, right now, we, due to the pandemic, we have situations where people are running out of food um, mm -hmm. and, and running out of food faster. Um, with, the high, with, with your system, with the hydroponic product, I'm saying hydro, I, I know this word, why am I not saying it? But hydro, it's like my cucumber. <laughs> I, <laughs> but with the, with, with the system in place, so I've been watching this for quite some time. I have a lot of friends that grow gardens. I have a lot of friends that are engineers. Um, I, I work with startups. So I've seen the system time and time and time again. Why isn't it that it is more, um, more popular with the masses? Because our soil is getting more and more contaminants globally. Um, soil is not the ideal situation to grow anything. Yeah. On a lot of different continents. And so why are we not adopting more ways to help um, help our communities grow better sustainable foods in a way that makes the most sense? So why hasn't your way been adopted faster? Uh, I th I'm, it might, might be my perception, but the idea that I have is that nowadays hydroponics, it's quite popular in the industry. Uh, so I would say it's not a, it's a number from my head from the world that I know, maybe I'm quite wrong, but I would say that 30 to 40% of what you eat of vegetables are grown hydroponically. Uh, tomatoes, strawberries, these are really, let's say, um, recurrent types of crops that you see in hydroponics. Uh, and I think that we still have the soil. Not We have a lot of people, so that would be a problem in the future, but I, at this point, I think the, 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 the biggest problem is the, the depletion of the soil due to intensive gardening and farming. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can, can uh, for sure uh, diminish that with hydroponics. Why aren't we changing faster? I would say it's something like I would call it purists. Uh, you are going also at the same time for the biological and the organic and hydroponics it's there's a really high debate whether if it's organic or not because okay you can give it to organic fertilizers but you are not growing on soil so is this a, a good trend and when i say the purists because of the of the flavor flavor because whether you think or not growing in hydroponics or growing in soil it has a difference of taste on the product uh, and some people simply don't like it or they don't want to accept it uh, and they prefer to keep, uh, let's say, I was, I was going to say a bad word, but they, they, they prefer to keep doing bad things to the soil and to the earth than to change a bit and let's say, okay, I don't care about the taste as long as it has the same nutritious value. I will not be worried if, if, if it's growing on soil, you know, something like that. It's been, it, well, it's so interesting what you just said because, um, the organic versus the not organic. I, if I'm actually eating something, I mean, look, well, I'll, I'll just use the example of a tomato. A tomato at a supermarket does not taste like a real tomato from when you're growing it. Whether exactly. it's hydro, hydroponic or whether it is in the soil, it's dramatically different when you mm -hmm. a tomato fresh. When I'm eating a tomato from the supermarket, which is very rare nowadays, it is it's bland, there's no flavoring. It is just like the worst of the worst, in my opinion. But yeah. most, people, most people that are in big cities, they don't have access. Most people that are in rural areas, they don't, I mean, I'm sorry, inner cities, um, they don't have access to that food. Um, mm -hmm. So how are we, or how is, you know, how is your world and how are we as in the consumers, how are we coming to, how should we, um, I'm, looking at this I'm losing my train of thought in regards to what I want to say. 
how are we to find a better way of getting better food sources to everyone, knowing that, that there is that those the, the purists that are out there telling you it's not organic, it's not good for you, but it is a natural way of creating food. I think that the thing there should be going to, how can I say, the, the consumer um, way of thinking or... Uh, because the problem is you don't buy a, a tomato if it's not fully round and fully clean. And if you go to a village where they grow they own, their own tomatoes, they, they eat those tomatoes, you know. And if they don't eat it, they use it to make ketchup, to make tomato sauce. So they don't waste anything. And I, as a consumer or a, as humans, as a consumer, we don't buy the product that seems a bit rotten. So I believe that just the waste that we are creating will thinking like this and buying stuff like this, uh, I would think that it would be more than enough to feed us all, you know? So I don't think it's not a way of how you grow, it's how you consume that should be changed. Uh, because you can always, yeah, you can go to hydroponics, you can grow much faster and yeah, it will be bland, but it will feed us, we won't starve. But at the end of the day, you are just, let's say, being done because you have to do this because you are not consuming right. And I think that the problem remains on the consumers, not on the on the producer. Yeah, something like that. I, I love how you do that. There's like a there's a company that just started. Um, it's called Ugly Food. People will not buy foods that are ugly. They want it. Yeah. And I was being first generation born in America and being Haitian. I would my mother would always go to my, my, my mother's a chef. She can make anything out of everything. It's like it's amazing. <laughs> like I go to the refrigerator. I'm like I there's nothing to eat, and she's da -da 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 -da, and she makes something. But she always taught us where farmers markets, um, which is like, is like a big place for her what to shop at. Um, and a farmers market, the tomato doesn't look perfect. It's just like it's yeah. crazy. And I always feel bad for the foods that look crazy because no one will buy it. So I'm always the one that buys it. Or I go to the back of the supermarket where they always have the shelves of all the foods that have a little bit of a dent in it that no one mm -hmm. will eat. And I buy them because I can make a soup. I can make a smoothie. I can eat that with no problem whatsoever. There's nothing wrong with it. You just like scrape off the little nick and yeah, a perfectly fine thing. So it is very surprising to me and frustrating when you're hearing about so many individuals that are not able to eat. And yet, when I go to a food bank and if I'm if I'm volunteering at a food bank, bank, I see a can of food and they're like, I go, well, we can't sell that. I'm like, why? There was a, there's a dent in the can. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, well, does it spoil the food that's inside the can? They're like, no, not <laughs> we'll buy it. Yeah, I know there are a few startups that are doing that kind of job, mm -hmm. uh, but but. It, it, how can I say it can be a business for sure? Uh, yeah. I won't doubt it. Uh, but but again, education. I think it has to do with us as a consumers. We are not. Everyone should be doing what you do. It's like yeah. I don't care. I can use the the perfect one for the salad and the the, the other one for the soup, and it's gone. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So walk me through. <laughs> if I'm an individual that wants to do business with you, like walk me through this company. So you so you've like you've tested the waters. You like went went through studies. You started this company. Who's your perfect target audience, as in who's going to use you and how mm -hmm. to work with you? Okay, we have, I would say, three types of, of, of clients. Actually, now we have two, two sides of business. So we have one side, the automation system that we sell and that we developed. And some of the people were asking for the water pumps, for the lights, for all that stuff. So we started a retail store also with that. So if you want to build your own indoor growth, you can go to our website, which is opengrow.pt, uh, and you get there a store where you can buy from the tent to the light, to the water pump, to the fertilizers. We just don't sell the seeds, but soon I believe we can also sell them. That's the first part. So if you want to grow inside and you don't know how to do it, just get in contact with us and for sure we can help you. Uh, the second part on the automation system as a more specific client, uh, it goes on three ways. So whether it is a, an indoor grower, uh, mostly cannabis growers that are growing indoor. The second one is for research and development. So people that are doing, for example, we did a, a mission with the Italian Space Agency. Uh, they were doing a simulated mission on Mars and they were growing uh, um, microgreens on hydroponics so they could see if it was viable to feed the astronauts. So our system was there to control the system. So they were kind of scientists gathering data and seeing if, if they, they could do. So on the research side, it's people that it's looking for data, mostly then control. 
yeah, usually they want to get data out of it so they can do our studies. And the third ones are anything related to hydroponic or vertical farming. Uh, so if you are transforming a container to be an hydroponic farm, uh, a rooftop that you have that it's uh, unused and you want to create a farm there, uh, usually they want some kind of control because they are these are places that are to be on site and no one should go there or, or the least time as possible to be there. And they want things automated and working as it should. So let's just start from the beginning. So um, I'm an individual that, am I an individual that's just, just interested in having uh, my own farm or is this, this, is this a larger scale individual that is trying to build a, a farm? So who is, it, who is it exactly that's like buying a kit? And yeah. I use it to assemble on my own. Do I have to call you and bring you in to assemble it or do I assemble it myself? No, no, you don't need that. You just buy a kit. It's a box with all the cables. It has an instruction manual. It's like assembling your, I don't know. Uh, Ikea? Uh, even even uh, easier than Ikea. Really? <laughs> Yeah, because you, you, yeah, you just need to plug in some cables on the correct place. You know, you, you cannot even miss it because the sockets are totally different. You cannot put cables where they shouldn't be. So it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of easy to assemble. We would usually say 15 to 20 minutes with uh, our basic kit. Uh, you just need to know, yeah, how to plug things and how to use a computer. Yeah, basically, that's it. So one of the things that people talk about all the time is the amount of electricity that's used and how it's so frustrating because I want to grow this. I want to have, especially like, I mean, living in New England, we have the winter, it would make sense. But in regards of the, what if something goes wrong and then you have water all over the place, how much water is being used and how much electricity is being used is a concern that I've heard over and over again. So what would you say to someone that's interested in doing this, but those are their fears? Okay, so if you have a fear of floods, don't worry, our system has a flood detector. <laughs> so we have a sensor that if it gets any kind of water on the floor, you put it on critical points that you think that can be a problem. Uh, and if it triggers, you can shut down the old system, it can send you an email, okay, you have a flood, you need to go there and to solve the problem. And the system won't, won't go until you tell the system that, okay, I cleaned everything, I solved the issue, we can go. Uh, regarding the savings, if you are controlling, we don't exactly measure the, the, the energy that is being used or the water that is being used. Uh, but if you are controlling, for example, the pH, uh, you are, it's less likely for you to need to change your water or to, or to have more water. So control, just the control brings you some, some kind of, of efficiency on, on the water and the energy that you're using. And is the yield of the food consistent? It depends. We are basically, our, our automation system, it's a tool for the grower. If it's being used by a bad grower, you know, so it, uh, it depends a lot on, on, on the person that it's using it uh, and the knowledge that she has or he, it has, yeah. Well, you, were, you were saying how you've created the system. It's like a nice box. You make it, it's self-sufficient. What if the person's a first timer where they just want to get into it? Do you, do you provide consulting so that way you're able to um, I, again, I've never done this before. I want to make sure I do it. Yes, you don't provide the seeds, but I'm going to buy the seeds. Um, do you provide guidance or counseling in regards of if you are stuck, we know that we're here for you. We don't just let you off by yourself. No, yeah, for sure. Uh, we do a lot of that via Instagram. People send us pictures of their plants and it's like, what's missing? Why are they yellow? <laughs> and, and for sure we can consult. If, you, if you're a first timer and you have an idea, okay, I want to do an indoor grow room for me. Uh, you just tell me, okay, I have one meter by one meter uh, and I'll get you a full kit with all the lights, with all the dirt, with all the fertilizers, everything that you need. Yeah. Awesome. You just need to gather the knowledge on the plant and all the many hours of light that she needs, uh, what, what's the best fertilized dosage for that plant, that stuff. And even with that, we can, we can assist for sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, I always wanted to do it and I just go back and forth. So after the drama of the summer, maybe. I'm, I'm, <laughs> by, this, by the end of this conversation, you may convince me. Um, I'm not gonna lie. I'm so jealous that you said Mars, um, <laughs> the space. How did that even happen? Because that's pretty amazing that that's even a thought process and you're involved in it. So how did that, how does that work where you're like, hey, I have this product and I'm just going to develop it and I'm going to start working with oh God, the space station and I'm going to start working with like, you know, getting it up to Mars. Yeah. Um, walk me through that. If whatever you can say, like, I know you can't, I mean, those. those no, it's okay. 
Yeah, so because tell me it, what it, happened. Actually, it's a fun story because we do, we actually did not work directly with them. So what happened is that we have a distributor in Italy that sells our product. And uh, okay, we sold them a, a few kits. And at some point, one of their clients, uh, no, better yet. At some point I was here at the job and I got a Twitter from a Portuguese astronaut uh, tagging us saying, okay, open grow stuff. It's on a Mars mission controlling the, the plants, you know? And I was like, what's happening? <laughs> this is a big thing, you know? And I did not even know him. So, so what happened is that they bought the kit as a, a final client, a consumer. Uh, they, they understood that the, the product that they were looking for was the, or they were seeing grow up was the product for, for what they need. And they not, did not even ask for any kind of sponsorship or partnership. It's just they bought it and they use it. And we got a, a Twitter saying that your product is being used on a simulated Mars mission, which was quite, quite fun. <laughs> but later, uh, a few years later, actually now, uh, we are going to sponsorship one program. And this time is the moon. It's not Mars, it's the moon. Yeah. I cannot say uh, so nothing cool. more, but yeah, yeah. That's just so cool. <laughs> But it's a, unfortunately, it's not going to the moon. It's a simulated moon mission. Doesn't matter. Doesn't yeah, it doesn't matter. For me, it's space. So a simulation for them to use you as a simulation means that they're going. They're they're testing it out to see if this is viable. So yeah. I mean, I'm sorry. Super cool. Yeah. <laughs> I, this is, these are the one of those moments where you're, when your parents are just wondering if you're like, oh, he's okay, he's working hard. This is one of those moments that every relative should know that you are working on this because it's being. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is like legit. Um, and so the third one is in regards of consulting, right? Yeah, uh, vertical farming, uh, ver ver hydroponics. So yeah. a, a, any kind. So is this like a? It's a, so, so now it, we're talking larger scale. Um, so. <laughs> Not larger, larger, but medium. Let's say, for example, an hotel lobby where you have those green walls. Yeah. Yeah, usually those are hydroponic systems. They have a water pump, they have pH control. We can automate uh, those kind of systems. Oh, that's nice. I go, so that, that's one of the things where a lot of, a lot of hotels, a lot of like restaurants are trying to, they're trying to be as green as possible. Yeah. And at yeah. and, and the same time as they're trying to be green, they're trying to have that, that look and feel of, look, we're keeping up with the times, look at our decor, et cetera. Yeah. And, and it is really easier to upkeep where you could just up, if something dies, you just take it apart versus taking the entire wall apart. Yes, exactly. So I've seen that before and I'm seeing it more and more. I mean, I, I, I saw, actually saw it at a casino. I um, mm -hmm. took a brand new casino that we have here and you, you hear the waterfall. It's just absolutely beautiful. It's very soothing. And then you're looking closer and you're like, oh, look at this. Every single one of them is an individual plant. Yeah, you can take it off. Yeah, they can change up during the holidays. So, are you providing you are you providing the plants as well, or is it just the system? No, just the automation. Now, with the retail side of the, of the business, we can also assemble those systems. But usually, those are more like by design. Let's say it like that. So you need a mixture between an agronomist and a designer to to reach what you have, or you can buy. There are some IKEA solutions. Uh, that you can buy. Usually they are on dirt and not on hydroponics. Yeah, it's some kind of pockets that you put on the wall that has some, but it's not the same. It, it gives the same look, but it has a lot of work because if you have a 10 feet uh, uh, tall uh, wall, it's really hard to go to the top and to to to, 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 to do some watering. Yeah. So it's, it's 100% true on that one. All right. So take us back to February when you're like working you have your plan mm -hmm. a new year the world starts to like the, the waves of noise start happening yeah. in the world more so in Europe so you're like the wave of conversations happening really really hard in Europe something's wrong something is happening and something's wrong and then we start like we start to shut down like little by little yeah. Europe start to shut down what did that do for you like I go what happened for you and your company during that time and how has it been, uh, how has it rolled out since? Okay, so, uh, so I, I did not confine. Uh, everyone here, on, I'm on the building with more companies uh, and everyone did. So I got the chance to keep on working confined because I was alone on the building mostly. And my partner was, was at home, he, he was confined at the moment. And curious what happened is that when people confined, they start to thinking of growing their own food. <laughs> so the phone here was not st 
stopping, you know, I want lights, I want dirt, I want uh, or your automation system. So as a few, I would say one month after my partner can find, I had to call him and say, okay, you have to come to work because me alone, I won't be able to deal with all of this. And so inside a bad thing, actually, it was a good thing for our business uh, because yeah, indoor grow has, has boomed at least for these past few months. Uh, so it was not a bad thing for open grow. I don't, I don't wish it for anyone, you know, Carvid could have stayed at, at his own and did, didn't bother us at all. But what happened is actually for open grow, it was quite of a, a good thing. Yeah. It's, it's very interesting that you say that. So I, um, I usually travel. I mean, during the summer, I'm usually in Portugal with you guys. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was very interesting because I have a, I, I'm part of a farm share, um, this, uh, of, of probably about 10 different farms. Uh, feed three towns so and okay. I'm pay into it it's great every Tuesday we pick up our food fresh fruit fresh food is fresh vegetables it's awesome um, their numbers went up the waiting list was through the roof and even now that the the season has ended people are now panicking because people don't want to go to the supermarket um, and so your numbers are going up are you finding that more people are looking like well actually like as the winter approaches what are people doing now? I mean, are they still able to grow during the winter time? And um, has the been is the business growing in different ways? Because, I mean, have you added something to the company to help individuals during the winter time? Uh, yeah, actually, for us, winter here it's the growing time when it when we talk about indoor. Yeah, because. Uh, Okay, technology is changing a bit, but the main problem was the lights that you used to grow. They are very hot lights. So in the summer here with 30, 40 degrees, uh, it's or Celsius, uh, it's really hard to have a lamp that is making so much heat. So you need to start to cool the grow and using air con conditioners, all that stuff. So it's not, how can I say, it's not uh, energetic viable. So in the winter is better because you use the heat of the lamp to, to compensate the cold that it's making outside. Mm -hmm. And now the technology changed a bit and now we have the LI, uh, LED lights, mm -hmm. which are much cooler. So it, you are now able to grow in the summer in Portugal without a problem. But yeah, the winter for us, it's a, it's a good indoor growing season, let's say it like that. Yeah. How was your team? I mean, like it was, it was just your two or the two of you or how big is the team? And how did you as the owner, the founder, the creator, the innovator, um, you have your, your thoughts and you, you are in the office, but you have a team. How was it to maintain the team and where were they at this time? Uh, I think that, uh, yeah, we had, I have a lot of trust with my partner and I think that was really, because when you send someone home to work, uh, if it's an employee, it's really to think, okay, the guy is going to be seeing movies all the day and not working. <laughs> and, and, and I did not feel that at all. You know, I had my partner at home and I knew that all the time he was there. If I picked up the phone or just call him on, on Skype or Discord, we could easily talk. Uh, so that was a big part of, 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 of working good. And so it actually was, at some point, it was good for the team because we were, and we are now, we aren't, but we were a two-man team. And we were spending a lot of time together, you know, like 10 hours a day working at the office. And now we're doing it the same, but okay. And when he can find, so we had some time of part of each other, which it's also good for a relationship, I think. Uh, we did not need it, but, but for sure it helped in some way because yeah, we got some part, time apart. Uh, but yeah, what happened is that he can find in, in one month after I have to call him in to work again, even with some cases on, on the street, but we had to do it. And this retail part, because of the indoor growing and even grow up, yeah, it grow, grow a bit from March to, to the end of the year. Uh, so we, now we are a three-man team. Yeah, we, we hire the third person to help us. Uh, and so far, it's a great acquisition for the team. And I'm, I'm okay. So it has been a month. And so far, so good. Nothing to tell bad about the, the our employee play is is quite great. <laughs> um, how many years have you been um, have you been alive? Like how long how long has your company been going? It's going to it's the sixth year. It's going to make seven next year in July. Yeah. And during the pandemic, is there something that you added that you would have thought maybe on our tenth year, maybe our fifteenth year, we're going to add to this company? But because we have the time and you didn't really have time, but everyone is home. 
Um, was there something that you added to the company that you would you would have never thought about adding? Uh, good question. Uh, I would say that the we always thought about the retail part of the business on the agricultural equipment because you know it's it's, it's an easy sell. Let's say it like that. People are always consuming these kind of materials, but it was never a focus. Grow Lab, the automation system, was the focus. So I think that the thing that grew the most from the pandemic was the retail store. So we improved a lot our website. We added a lot of products because we knew that people were at home buying. So they weren't coming to the store. Uh, and yeah, I think that was the main drive to create a bigger business on the retail side. When I'm thinking about um, the amount of people that are at home um, and they have their jobs or they have gotten fired um, um, or they're just like trying to rethink their lives and they look at, they look at you, they look at you and think, huh, I, I, he went with his idea. I wonder how he did it. What advice would you give to someone that is thinking about starting a business right now during this pandemic, during the, the during the, they, they've lost it all or they're just complacent where they're like, I'm not happy where I realize now I'm not happy where I am. What would you say as good advice for someone that's looking to start their own business? Ah, good question. So I would say you will not be rich from day to night and not even in, from year to year. Uh, I think that even if you know, first of all, you need to know that you can make money without what you're selling. Even if someone tells you that you can't, if you deeply believe it, you should go with it and try to find the funds to do it. Uh, the second advice is that it's not an easy job. Uh, when you think, like I said in the beginning, you think that the bosses have it all, you know, they have the money, they, they have everything, but they don't. They have all the responsibilities they have a lot of weight on, on their shoulders. Uh, and I think that that was something that I overlooked when I started. I think, okay, I'm going to build some electronics and it's going to be great. And we have some money on the account, so let's do it. And after three years, okay, we are running out of money. <laughs> you know, we need to sell, but I don't like to sell. It's not my thing. I like to build, but I needed to do it. So I need to change a lot of things about myself to do it. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's a process. It's not something... It's, it's not going to happen from the day to, to the night to the day, and it will take you a lot of work and a lot of dedication. Uh, you can have it like that, but I believe that's 1% or even less of the companies that start. 99% of them have to work a lot and promote themselves a lot and be in every event and uh, taking care of the worst client that you have. You have to be like, okay, thank you, sir. <laughs> you know, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of hard work, but at the same time, it's, uh, how can I say? It's good. I have my own schedule. Of course, mm -hmm. I, I, I go by normal schedule, but yeah, I stay here until late. If I want to work at home, I work. If I want to come here on the weekend and do stuff, I'm not like, who is going to pay me for coming Saturday morning? You know, it's like, no, I have work to do. I'll go there on the Saturday morning. And this is the kind of mindset that you need to have when you have a business. Yeah. What is the high, 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 as in like the most amazing thing, the thing that's ever happened with you since you've owned your company? And what's the worst? And you don't have to like, nothing major personally, but the worst, what's the highs and the lows? Because People are just like, now they're like, okay, if I'm going to go for it, I'm going to go for it. But what should I prepare for as my high and my low? Huh. Those are, I would say there are highs. You can find them as, as long as lows. You can find them like every month, you know. When he, we got to Twitter from the Mars thing, it was a, a really high point for us. Okay. Uh, when you get a client that says, okay, my, my module is not working. Things are doing strange stuff. And you are like, okay, what is burning now? You know, and that's, that's a really can bring you low. Uh, I'll give you an example. We had a client here that bought some kind of... Um, um, bug insect spray thing <laughs> and what happened is that he used it wrong uh, and he ended up killing or damaging their plants yep. so he arrived there like it was our fault you know and we were not even thinking that it was not our fault it was like okay we sold you a product that actually is not that good 
But then we do our research and we went a bit and we understood, no, this is not our problem. We sold you the, the right product. You just use it badly. Yeah. And it took us a week, you know, but with one client saying one thing like that, it can ruin your day. You know, it'd be like, okay, why did I sell that? Why I'm going to remove that from the store? And then you realize, no, it's, it's not a problem with the product. It was the person. And so and, lows and, you know, like it, this. It's so, it's so surprising how it just takes one little thing to ruin the entire day. Yeah. Of the entire week. Yeah. Yeah. You can have like the best day ever knowing you have a really nice mission using your product. You made uh, a few thousand euros selling your product. And there's one guy that says, okay, this doesn't work. And even if it's his fault, you, you, would, you will feel that and it will be, uh, it will bring you down. Yeah. yeah. It's, that, it's that one moment of doubt that can ruin the best ideas. Yeah, I've, I've watched and witnessed so many people that are like brilliant minds, brilliant products. And then that one minute of doubt or that one individual that said something and it just like literally, it takes such a long time. And you said, you just said it a week. It takes such a long time to like heal from the heal from the scars of, a, yeah. of someone doubting your product or your services. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's not easy. But I have a lower point. Yeah, the lower point was when the company was struggling a bit and we had to fire one employee. Uh, and he was a really good one. We really liked him. And actually, when we opened the job again, we called him, but he was already on another, another job. But yeah, that was a low point for us. It was like we were really depressed, like, okay, this is it. <laughs> Open Grow, it's going to end, you know. Let's pack our bags. But yeah, things happen and we are still there. Yeah. The, the, the turnaround, um, I love when the companies turn around, um, there's that moment of just the aha. Uh -huh. So you were close to, you You had to terminate a, uh, an employee. Um, the company wasn't doing great. What was that moment of turnaround? Like what happened? Did you bring someone in? Did you did you, re did you and your partner reevaluate? Like what is that moment? Because so many people just stop. They just ended. They're like, I quit. So yeah. what is that moment where you're like, I go like, okay, it's the, I'm going to pivot. Actually, it was that moment brought us at the moment, my partner was not my partner. He was an employee of Open Grow. Uh, and what I understood and what I saw from the years that he was working and he was just like helping me. Okay, we'll keep a one or two more months just to close, thing, close things up and put everything together. And what happened is that, how can I say, he took the, 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 the drive a bit you know, and he was fresh blood with new ideas. Yeah, I was also a bit tired of pushing the same thing, which, which happens on a company. Uh, and yeah, basically become my partner on that moment when he was like, okay, no, we can still do this, you know? Uh, and yeah, it changed. Now we are, let's say, equals. And it's, I tell him, sometimes he's the CEO, it's not me. Whenever I want to take a decision, firstly, I ask him, you know, and we discuss it. I don't, I don't take it alone at this moment. And I think that was quite important. Stop making decisions alone. That was something that I was doing it a lot. Yeah. It, being in your own head when you're running a business is sometimes dangerous. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, where do you see the industry happening? I mean, like, I mean, we we have now you've been you've now been pushed to the limit of people need alternative ways to get food now. Like the, it's not mm. the big farmers, it's the consumer. I want to find alternative ways. I want to have control over what's going into my body. And so what do you see the world evolving to um, while we're still in the pandemic? We don't know when this is going to end. I mean, yeah. the last time we ever dealt with a pandemic was, a, I mean, we didn't deal with it. It was a hundred yeah. years ago. So where do you see the industry for you and just overall everyone in the food industry going as we're dealing with and living with the pandemic and after the pandemic? Uh, I think it, it depends a lot on the time that we are going to be in this state. Uh, I think that COVID will, will be something like the flu. I don't know that you have to take a shot every year, you know, and if it's something like that, uh, if we like in the next six months, one year, we solve it in some way, uh, I don't think the industry will adapt that much. The business will adapt because there's a lot of new business with the COVID thing, whether it's selling a mask or uh, disinfectant, stuff like that. So there, there will be a lot of business popping out and a lot of business going down, yeah. Uh, in the food industry, I think that the industry already has the level of automation and the level of lower maintenance, let's say that, or less labor. They are, because I don't know if you felt that, at least in Portugal, we did not miss any kind of vegetables on our stores. 
even with people confined. So the industry is working, you know, so they, 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 they did not need some kind of uh, shock adaptation to it because they were already somewhat prepared. Mm -hmm. So I don't see a bigger change. What I see, it's mostly they will understand that, okay, we need to automate more. So we don't, we have less people on site. So if something like this happens again, we can still pr be producing tomatoes and cabbages and selling it to people. Mm -hmm. I think that what, uh, uh, what for us, um, the food that we would get overseas, you weren't seeing because everything was closed. The local was getting a lot more attention. So for every country, your local goods were getting a lot more attention than the international yeah. goods. Yeah, the thing here in Portugal is that we already re rely a lot on the local producers. So all the Portuguese knows that uh, wine Porto comes from Porto, the por the pigs come from the south, uh, you know, you know exactly where your food comes from because we are a small country. In the States, it must be totally, totally different for sure. Well, I mean, I mean, you're looking at any, I mean, any food that we get, we're looking at the sticker and we're like, okay, where is it coming from? Mm -hmm. it, it was really, really wonderful to be able to, um, I mean, I know all the farms that are in my state. I mean, they're not even in other states. It's in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. all the farms that, we were getting the food and the food was great. I mean, I was very happy. I mean, and I'm, and I'm also in shape. I'm better, I'm healthier and I'm in shape because everyone's like, oh, I, I gained so much Corona weight. I'm like, I didn't because I was eating healthy. I was yeah. eating healthier than I usually would because I knew exactly where my food was coming and I was cooking it, which was a lot of fun because I was getting all the seasonal foods and I yeah. was like research, like what's this and what am I going to make with this? Never bought this before because we, we go to the market and we buy the same kinds of foods all the time. Yeah fun when you're getting seasonal foods because then you get to be a little bit more creative in what you're making yeah you need to adapt for sure yeah, yeah. so um my last question i have my I, this this goes by so fast there's so much to talk to you <laughs> but my last question to you is if you were going to ask um the anyone that's watching you right now a personal ask and a professional ask what would it be that you'd want people to like learn from you like what do you want from people so your personal ask and your professional ask Okay, I'm going to be a bit political here. So my personal ask would be go to vote. You know, I know you have a really tough election going and your country is kind of messed. <laughs> so voting for sure is something that you need to do and, and take that out of the way and, and get a good democracy going on the States. Uh, a professional one, uh, I would say uh, we don't have any kind of distribution on the United States. We still don't have uh, our, we sell to clients on the United States. They come to us and we sell directly to them, but we don't have any kind of company that is distributing our products. So if, if you want to do it, if you think it's an, a business opportunity for you, get in contact with me and we can talk a bit and see how we can do that. Uh, and who says the United States, we also say Canada because you are on the same continent. So yeah, that would be my, my, my business ask. <laughs> oh my goodness. My friend, thank you so very much for taking no, Thank you, Jody. I mean, I, I, I love learning more. I, when I'm with you guys, we're just talking business whenever I'm in Portugal. I go, mm -hmm. we have our social time, but we're not talking anything else, but just like- We are debating what we worked, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly, <laughs> which, is really, which is really good. But I mean, this is one of those moments where I really do enjoy one checking to see that you guys are okay. Yeah, you're okay. You look good. You look healthy. You look good. Yeah. Okay, I, go, great. I go that a hair. A bit pale. A bit that pale hair. because of the, the lack of sun. <laughs> but but I mean, you I mean, I, I'm happy to see that you're doing a-okay. I'm so happy, so happy that the business is doing well. And but it's the personal part of getting to know you beyond your business. Mm -hmm. Do that when we're together in Portugal. And yeah. Yeah. Being able to share not only with other people, but for me to hear about how you grew up and where your thoughts and your processes came from and how you had passion. I mean, the, like, I was going to say, little... it's a fly, you know, it's, <laughs> it is never, there's never a flyer and now it, it just show up. <laughs> well, it's so funny because um, I've had cats walk over the computers, <laughs> parking, I've had children, I've had a UPS guy, I've seen it all right now. And so yeah. I love the fact that the fly, <laughs> it's the first yeah um no but i do love and appreciate getting to know you on a different level because people so often just assume oh an entrepreneur just comes out of nowhere and they don't oh no there's like a whole person and the, 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 all the expertise that literally makes that business grow um there's someone that really was passionate about solving a pain point and you are solving one of the greatest 
pain points globally that we're having. And so thank you. Thank you. The curious little kid. <laughs> it's my pleasure always to be the curious guy in the room. <laughs> oh my God. I love it. I love it so much. So thank you so very much. Um, at the beginning of next year, I'm going to circle back and check in with a lot of people and just to see okay, great. what you're doing, because I want to see how the rest of the year plays out. I mean, because I know, yes, our elections are going to play a big, big role. Um, and um, literally, like when this when this interview plays out, I go, it will, the election will probably already have happened. And so it'll be very interesting to see how it plays, not just for our country, but everyone around the world is watching. I mean, yeah, yeah. Everyone you are a big country. You, you, you have a lot of influence on the world. And, yeah. It, yeah. It, and, and right now we are, it's, it's sad because being first generation born in America, and my parents came to America for the American dream for, for them, mm -hmm. for their kids. And to watch the world worry, like they're worried too, because it does affect everyone. Love us, hate us. It affects everyone and everyone's dreams and everyone's thoughts and everyone's livelihood. And so it's frustrating when you're here and you're seeing how so much disarray is happening in the country, yeah. knowing that we should be working better together and not separated, se separating our thoughts. So thank you very much for saying that yeah. loud, but I really do hope that um, the next time I talk to you, it's better. <laughs> for sure it will. Yeah. It, you know what? It, it will be better. It will be better. Yeah. All right. Jody, thank you very much. It was thank a pleasure. You. Oh my God. It was God, a nice conversation. You. Oh, it was fun. It was like, I mean, again, <laughs> I, I always tell people, I'm not Oprah. I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Talk, talk to you soon. Okay. Bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs>